So, I'm Oded Naor from the Technion, like it said, and today I'll present T-Chain, which is a secure payment network with asynchronous blockchain access. This paper was accepted also to SOSP this year, and is a collaboration with the following fine people behind me. And I'll start with a quick background. So I assume that everybody knows that a blockchain is permissionless usually, and it's a replicated state machine. So basically, you have a bunch of nodes, which have to be at the same state, roughly at the same time. If Alice and Bob join the network, then every new block that arrives, they have to process it and update the state of the system uh, for the new state of the blockchain. This leads to the scaling problem. So, like I said, every node processes all the transactions, and we want mobile phones to, do, to be able to process it. So Bitcoin can achieve around seven transactions per second, while centralized payment hubs like Visa and MasterCard can process up to 100,000 transactions per second. So I guess you see the difference. What are the solutions? So you can change the blockchain itself. You can tweak the parameters. You can increase the block size. You can decrease the interval between blocks. But it's a sort of a band-aid. I mean, you still have the same root problems. You can also change the protocol itself. These are some examples. Bitcoin NG, Algorand, Avalanche, sharding solutions. All of them are solutions which change the layer one. Uh, and one of their advantages is that they say they increase the throughput. Off-chain solutions is another avenue. Um, and it's payment networks where you execute payments off-chain. So parties pay each other directly instead of broadcasting a transaction to every node in the, in the network, having it process it as part of a block. Now we have a network of payment channels. So nodes in this uh, example are payment uh, uh, are players. And an edge in this graph is a payment channel. So in a payment channel, it allows point-to-point -point payments. Alice can pay Bob directly without having to broadcast the transaction to the entire chain. And we'll discuss bidirectional channels, meaning that both Alice and Bob pay on the channel between them both ways, not only Alice to Bob. And we need to say a word about multi-hop payments, which is, for example, Dave wants to pay to Bob, but he doesn't have a direct channel with him, so he pays with a multi-hop payment through an intermediary, which in this case is Alice. So let's do a deep dive into payment channels. Payment channels is between two parties only. Again, the example is Anis and Bob. And the goal is that you interact with the blockchain only on two occasions. In the case of bilateral agreement between Alice and Bob, they interact with the blockchain when they create the channel and when they settle the channel. But every payment network or payment channel should have the ability for either side to unilaterally place a transaction on chain and settle the channel unilaterally. The result is that all the intermediary transactions between Alice and Bob, between when the channel is created and until when the channel is settled, don't go on the blockchain at all. So we reduce the number of transactions that need to be broadcast and processed by every node on the system. Let's look at an example again. We have a payment channel between Alice and Bob. What's below the line is the blockchain. What's above is off-chain. Uh, usually it starts with Alice placing a deposit on-chain to fund the channel. So now the channel is funded, Alice has $100, Bob has zero because he hasn't funded it. And now they can start paying, paying each other. So in this example, Alice pays Bob $3, the new balance is 97.3. Bob has now some money, we're talking about bidirectional channels, so he can pay her back $1. Sometime in the future, Bob says, hey, I wanna settle the channel. So he places a transaction on chain that settles the channel per the new balance. He pays Alice back $98 and Bob gets two. What we want to ensure is that you can prevent rollback attacks. Rollback attacks mean that we need some way to prevent Bob from settling at an older state. 97.3 is much better for Bob than 98.2. He has one extra dollar. And we need to prevent Bob from being able to settle at an older state than the newest one. So existing solutions, and obviously I'm talking about the Lightning Network in general, Assume what we call synchronous access to the blockchain. What does it mean? Is it means that you need to constantly monitor the blockchain. And in case one of the parties misbehaves, you need to react with some predefined uh, constant. Here we name it delta. So let's look at the execution. 
Uh, sometime during the execution, Bob settles the channel. And now Alice has delta time to react. If Bob misbehaves, she needs to place some transaction on the blockchain that nullifies Bob's wrong settlement. After delta passed, the settlement is finalized and both of them have access to the funds. Now, there is significance to the determination of delta. If you, say, if you define their delta to be large, then it's harder to attack the system. Alice has a long time to react, but both Alice and Bob have slower access to their funds. If you said delta to be too small, it's very easy to attack the system. Alice might not be able to react in time, but both of them, Alice and Bob, if everything is all right, have quick access to their funds. The problem with both of these uh, uh, definitions of delta is that blockchains are best effort. So this is a graph that shows over time, over a course of about a year and a half, the time it took for an average, tran an average transaction from the moment it was uh, broadcast to the mempool and until it was mined. Uh, and you can see that it usually takes a few hours, but during peak times at around January 18, for example, it took over a day and a half for a single transaction to be mined. So if you had a payment channel with a lot of money and you tried to close it during January 18, and Bob settled it in the wrong state, Alice might lose her money. So there is significance of setting delta, and as I said, blockchain is best effort. It doesn't guarantee anything on the time it takes to mine a transaction. This is where teaching comes into play. So the challenges was that we faced when we designed teaching was first that we wanted to remove the blockchain as a root of trust, meaning we wanted to remove the need for synchronous blockchain access when designing the whole payment channel network. The idea we chose is to use a, another route of trust or payments, which we named treasuries, but basically they're consisted of TEEs. I'll explain in a minute what they are, but uh, basically they're dedicated hardware that are supposed to run secure code. The problem with TEEs is that real implementations of TEEs are not necessarily secure. We've seen in the past year that there have been attacks on the most uh, known implementation of TEE, Intel SQX, uh, which essentially broke it. So what we did was what we created, we called it treasury committees for each deposit, and again, I'll explain in a minute what it means. So a word on trusted hardware, the abbreviation of TEE is trusted execution and environment, and the guarantees are as follows. It provides confidentiality of the code that is run inside the TEE, so you can prevent Alice who runs the TEE from accessing stuff that you don't want her to see, even though she's running it on her CPU. And it also guarantees the integrity of the results. So you, Alice can prove to Bob that a piece of code that she says she's running on a TEE is actually run on a TEE, and Bob trusts that. So you can prove the, uh, the integrity of the results, and it uh, guarantees against both software and physical attacks. So anything that is not a CPU and not the code that is run on the TEE is untrusted. The BIOS, the OS, the bus, the RAM, everything that is not the enclave, which is the dedicated part of the TEE, is untrusted. Now, real implementations of TEEs are actually happening. These are some examples. Like I said, the most prominent one is Intel SGX, but also ARM Trust Zone and Keystone, which is part of the open source uh, RISC-V project from Berkeley. So let's look at a Stroman example of designing a payment channel using a TEE. So we want to design a payment channel between Alice and Bob using a single TEE. And if we have a single TEE, then it's some entity, they talk to it, uh, and it might work. I mean, it handles the channel, it handles the deposit, the payments. The problem with a single TE is that behind every TE, there is some Dave who is running the TE, and Dave might be malicious. So he can't access the code that is running inside the TE, but he can then definitely shut his computer down and prevent Alice and Bob from actually accessing their funds. And like I said, we want both sides of the channel to unilaterally be able to close the channel. So a single TE doesn't work. So the trust model is a bit different. We have Alice and Bob and both of them are running TEs. And the trust model is as follows. Alice trusts her own TEE for the availability of the funds. Even though she doesn't have the secret key for the deposit, she trusts that her TEE will always create a settlement transaction which will, will allow her to close the channel at the last date. But she also needs to trust Bob's TEE from preventing Bob to settle the channel at an earlier state. 
So this is what prevents a Welbeck attack. And of course, the trust model is mirrored to Bob. So again, let's look at that example. We have Alice, which is now running a TEE, Bob, which is now running his own TEE, and we have a payment channel between them. They, they create a deposit, place it on chain, but now the deposit is created with a secret key which is stored inside the TEE, Alice's TEE. Now they can start paying one another, just like we've seen. And when Bob wants to settle, he instructs his TEE to create a settlement transaction. He takes the settlement transaction which was created inside the TEE, again with a secret key that he doesn't know, but is stored inside the TEE, and places it on chain. But like I said, we know that a single T is not necessarily safe. We've seen that real implementations like Intel SGX can be compromised. The most prominent example is for Shadow, for those of you who know it. Essentially, it broke SGX and the secrets that were stored inside it before Intel issued its patch were vulnerable. Everyone can see it. So the solution we thought is nice is to decentralize TEs. And what I mean is I mean we use treasury committees. So again, we have a channel between Alice and Bob, but instead of one TEE on each side, we use a committee or a variety of TEEs. And we uh, take advantage of the fact that there are multi-sig on almost all blockchains, and we need now M of N committee members to sign each transaction. This allows us to create heterogeneity of TEE implementations. So you can have a committee of an Intel SGX, Trust Zone, and Keystone when they'll be available. So now to break Let's say a committee of three, of two out of three, you'd need to break two TE implementations instead of one, which seems more secure because, again, each attack requires time and money. So we think that combining TEs and committees is actually gives many advantages. Nice. Uh, committees, like I said, M of N signatures. If you increase M, you get higher security. You need more signatures, more TE implementations for each trans transaction. If you increase N, you get higher redundancy. You have more copies of the state. You have more flexibility of choosing the subset of M, M members. Also, it allows dynamic committee sizes for each deposit. So you can have deposits of large value, have more committee members and more signatures. And when you have a channel of, with a small, I don't know, $10, you'd only have a committee of one. TEEs allow first TE heterogeneity. You can use real implementations, different implementations of TEs for your committee, and also it allows to break the need for corruption. You actually need to break a TE implementation to break the channel design, whereas if you only use a committee, you can corrupt the committee members. Now, I'm not done yet, but I want to refer you to the full paper for some of the stuff I won't have time to talk. First of all, it's a multi-hop protocol. So like I said, a multi-hop protocol is praying through an intermediary. And because we can't use the blockchain as a root of trust or a synchronization mechanism like the Lightning Network does, we do what we have, uh, which is a variation of multi-phase commit. We also have dynamic fund deposits, which allows to add remove funds to channel as needed, whereas in the Lightning Network, you have to actually fund the channel when you create it. We also have chain replication variation for the committee. Instead of running a consensus, we do a variant of chain replication. And we also have some features and nice optimizations. Some of them are dynamic payment channels, which allow uh, to create dynamically payment channels uh, when channels are locked as part of a multi-op protocol. And we also have a nice uh, version of stable storage, which allows for crash fault tolerance. Let's talk about the security now of a payment channel network. So let's assume now that TE actually works. We've managed to create a payment channel network, and now we want to say that we have a safe and secure and decentralized payment channel network, and this is the part of the paper where we explain what that means. So I'll explain it through an example. Let's say we have a payment channel network with, where Alice has a channel with Bob and Dave, and Alice has overall three Bitcoins on all our channels in the network, so she might have two Bitcoins on the channel with Bob and one Bitcoin on the channel with Dave, but overall she has three Bitcoins. And now let's look at the execution. So let's say that during the execution she paid Bob one Bitcoin on the channel between them. Now she has three minus one, she has two Bitcoins on overall all the network. Maybe sometime in the future Dave paid her two Bitcoins, so now she has four Bitcoins overall. Basically every time during this execution, Alice can look at all her channels and say, 
This is my perceived balance. This is the money I have on all my open channels in the network. Now, it's important to say that perceived balance, um, again, I'll do it through an example. We have Alice and Bob, and let's say that Alice paid Bob one Bitcoin on the channel between them. Uh, paying means sending a message. We're talking about an asynchronous setting, meaning that the message takes time to arrive and we don't know how much time it takes. But let's say that Alice had one Bitcoin on all her channels before, and after she sent a message, she has zero Bitcoins. Well, Bob, before he received the message from Alice, had zero Bitcoins, but after he received it, he has one Bitcoin. So you can see between the message left and the message arrived, both Alice and Bob think they have zero Bitcoins. And that's fine, again, it's part of the definition when you, uh, when you uh, have asynchronous communication. We, later, you can use the blockchain as a synchronization mechanism, but I won't have time to go into it. So, balance security. The intuition behind it, you don't have to read it. Balance security basically means that every user in the system can say, show me the money. He can say, this is my perceived balance. Again, this is the money I have on all my open channels. I want to receive that money by doing a series of transactions, by placing a series of transactions on chain. If Alice, Bob, Dave, Carol, everybody in the network can receive their perceived balance on chain, then we say that the payment channel network achieves balance security. So again, Alice can say, I want my perceived balance, which she knows every moment during the execution, and by doing some algorithms, some placing a series of transactions on chain, she can actually receive this perceived balance. Now, I won't have time to go to the full proof. It's about 15 pages long, and it's very tedious. But I'll give you the intuition of the proof itself. We did it in the universal composability framework, which is basically for simulation proofs, uh, proving analyzing cryptographic protocols. You define, and I'll say terms which probably some of you don't understand. Not a problem. We defined some ideal functionality, which we call the FT chain. Uh, where, and then we proved that the real world and the ideal world, the real world is the world where the protocol, the actual teaching protocol runs. The ideal world is an idealized version of the real protocol, which proved that they're indistinguishable, meaning that you can distinguish between running in the real or ideal world. That means that if you can attack the protocol in the real world, you can also simulate an attack of, in the ideal world. And then if you can prove that balance security holds in the ideal world, then it also holds in the real world. So it's a process. Uh, again, you can see the full paper for the entire proof of how we did uh, show that teaching is secure. Let's talk about a bit about implementation and evaluation. So uh, we implemented the teaching network. We ported the BTC core uh, C++ code. And we used it to implement teaching. So the trusted code, which is run inside the XSGX, consisted of around 20,000 lines of C++ code. The untrusted code consisted of around 65,000 lines. And we open sourced the implementation. You can find it in GitHub in this repo. So let's talk about the evaluation a bit. Uh, what we wanted to ask when we evaluate the teaching is first, how well do payment channel, a single payment channel, performs? We measured it in terms of throughput latency, and I'll show you the results in a second. We also wanted to look at multi-hop payments, again, paying through an intermediary, and we wanted to check a network. So we wanted to see if we created a graph of payment channels, how well is our implementation scale. Our baseline was the state-of-the-art lightning network at Daemon during the time that we evaluated it. And please remember that the lightning network requires synchronous access to the blockchain, whereas chain does not. The experimental setup we used was 35 SGX machines uh, in London, New York, and Haifa. I think it was uh, Xeon processors. So let's start with uh, payment channel performance, a single payment channel. Yeah, it's a payment channel that was between London and New York, and we used Haifa, the Israeli machines, as, as uh, committees. And we measured the throughput in terms of transactions per second and the latency of our payments. And again, we varied the committee sizes uh, in all the places, uh, going from one committee size to an increasing number of uh, committee members. So when we measured it with the Lightning Network, again, on a channel between London and New York, we measured around 1,000 transactions per second. 
when we had one committee member, we scaled up to 130,000 transactions per second. Basically, we, because we don't have to wait for a whole return trip, you just send one message for a single payment. But things turn down when you increase the committee size. So you can see that there is a bound, which is around 33,000 in terms of throughput, uh, when you increase the committee size from one to two, because you need to update every member of the committee uh, for every payment but still it's 33 times better than the Lightning Network. In terms of latency, the Lightning Network is around 400 milliseconds. Again, for a single payment between London and New York. A single payment with a T-chain with one committee member was around 86 milliseconds, and it grows linearly as uh, the committee size grows. And at around three committee members, we're at around the same latency as the Lightning Network. Also in evaluation, we wanted to check if teaching scales out. So we tested two graph scenarios. The first was a complete graph, meaning that all the nodes are connected to every other node. And we saw that teaching scales to a million transactions per second uh, with 30 nodes and three committee members for each node. Again, there aren't any multi-op payments in this because there are payment channels between every single node but we took the Bitcoin blockchain and used it as a benchmark. So we allocated random addresses to all the 30 nodes and did the payments for the uh, Bitcoin history. And we did manage to achieve around a million transactions, which is nice. We also did what we think is a more realistic scenario of a hub and spoke graph where you, uh, where you have small, medium, and large nodes in terms of uh, the number of edges they have, the payment channels they have. And then you need to have multi-hop payments if you want to pay, for example, between small nodes. And we saw that this scales linearly by using dynamic channel creation. Again, dynamic channel creation means that you dynamically create temporary channels in case there is a multi-hop payment and you need to block uh, a path is blocked. So again, you can see the results uh, in the full paper. So let's summarize. Like I said, blockchains are best effort. That means that the security of a system shouldn't rely on the time it takes to read or write from the blockchain. And if it does rely on that, you should use large timeouts, especially for large amounts of money. Like I said, the blockchain itself doesn't guarantee anything on the time it takes to write a transaction. If you want to be more secure, you need to assume asynchronous blockchain access. You need to assume that you don't know the bound on the time it will take you to write on the blockchain. These themselves are no panacea, meaning that you need to allow some degree of failure. You can't assume that a TE does everything it's supposed to do, and the system is secure because we used uh, an Intel SGX. And we think that committees complement TEs in a nice way because it allows some degree of failure when you design the system. Like I said, teachings design is secure in terms of balance security. Uh, everyone is able to receive their perceived balance on chain. And if you go to teaching.network, you'll be able to see links to the SOSP version, the full version, and our open source code uh, for you to play around if you want to. Uh, I have some time. First of all, I'll thank you, and I'll take any questions if you have those. Thank you. The what, sorry? The, the, the committee size and also the uh, complexity of you know, the floor. Hmm? Uh, and then there's also the question of you could also dial in. Can you dial in? I remember reading a, one of the early papers from you last year or two years ago. But can you dial in like how many different uh, trusted execution environment implementations you can use? So I could say, well, it has to be one SGX, one uh, uh, Keystone, one whatever. So let's say you have a payment channel with Alice and Bob, and it's up to Alice and Bob. They can decide if they want to accept what the other side proposes. So if Bob sees Alice's deposit, and it's only backed up by only one Intel SGX and not any other TE implementation, he can choose not to participate in that channel. So it's up to the participants of the system itself. That's what we think is a nice use of TEs in a payment channel, because it's not that the whole system is uh, relies on the TEs. 
uh, the blockchain itself is, I mean, secure by assumption. Uh, it's up to you to choose if you want to participate in a payment channel or not. So if you do participate, it means that you trust the committee sizes and the TE implementation. Yeah, any other questions? And I s looks like my time is out, so, oh. Hey, uh, I was just curious, so the, the 100,000 transactions per second, is that in Seagull machine? Is it what, sorry? Is it on a Seagull machine? Like, a like, do you, no, do you, do you verify, do we verify that? So you're talking about the 130,000 transactions, yeah. uh, the throughput between on a payment channel, it was between two SQX machines, one in London and one in New York. It was across the Atlantic. And so you verify that many signature per second? What, sorry? Does it involve verifying that many signatures per second? Is it hardware? So, so actually you don't need to verify more than one time. When you create a channel, you need to create an attestation which verifies that the code is run on an Intel SQX, but paying doesn't involve verifying signatures. No. Oh, okay, cool. All right, we can take care of that. Okay, thank you.